Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our panel on Women in Information Security. My name is Joan Goodchild. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of CSO Online and CSO Magazine. NPR reports that 80% of computer programmers are men. And a most recent body of research sponsored by Symantec found that only 11% of women are the workforce of information security is only comprised of 11% of women. So as a organization that's dedicated to diversity and appreciates gender diversity, OWASP has asked me here to host this panel on how we can close that gap. Um, we have invited several women and one gentleman <laughs> for some perspective on that. They're going to give uh, their perspective on the issue as well as share some experiences from the course of their career and, uh, and hopefully you all too will have some uh, questions and insight to offer into this issue. So let me introduce our panelists. On the end here we have Don Marie Hutchinson. She is the Senior Manager of IT Security for Urban Outfitters. Welcome, Don. Second, we have Carrie Scapper. She is a Security Analyst, Penetration Tester, Incident Response Specialist with the Federal Government. In the middle we have Stacy Bertrand. She is a sec uh, Manager of Security with Accenture. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Nancy Lawrenson. She is the Security Program Manager with Infinite Campus. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. And our gentleman on the panel today is Gary Phillips. He is the Senior Director of R&D with Symantec. Thank you all for joining us. So let's get the discussion started by getting some uh, input from members of the panelists on how they've seen the role of women evolve and change, contrast perhaps to the beginning of your career to, to what you're seeing now. Is anyone have any strong feelings about starting? Do you want to start on the end, Don? All right, so when I started um, in information security, uh, not unlike this, this room even, um, I was the only woman really in IT, period. So when I, got, when I joined that team, I had some cultural hurdles that I had to get over because there were things that the team did together that I might not be interested in. So, but as, as it's grown, um, I've been in my career about 15 years now, and I'm in an organization now, Urban Outfitters, 36% of our IT workforce is women um, at Urban, and that's significant. And, um, and so to see that change where I was the only woman in IT to where I'm one of a hearty crowd now is really, um, it's really encouraging, I think. Mm. Testing, testing. Okay. <laughs> so um, I've been in the industry for maybe like 12 years, and I've actually been working on a book uh, which describes uh, my adventures in this industry. So uh, I just maybe want to read like um, part of my intro of what um, my experiences have been like in it. So since I've been in this industry, um, I've been roofied, poisoned, stalked, targeted by penetration testers, DOS, doxed, uh, targeted by automated dialing attacks, sometimes at my employer, ridiculed, shunned, mocked, the butt of jokes, sexually harassed, exploited, brought to tears, targeted by foreign uh, hacker hacking entities, and targeted by law enforcement. And I'm still here, and come at me, bro. <laughs> this is, um, I guess, not quite as, as um, intense as that in consulting, but I remember one of my first meetings uh, that I was leading by myself, the, uh, the company actually thought I was the secretary and asked if I could get coffee. Um, so I think now there's been uh, increased awareness of women in security and women in tech in general, where I'm no longer the secretary um, benefit. <laughs> So I guess I, I probably have the most gray hairs of the women on this panel, <laughs> uh, meaning I've been uh, around a little bit longer, not necessarily in the IT industry uh, specifically, but um, involved with some form of technology, I'm going to say the last 30 years. Uh, in in uh, college, I remember uh, having to kind of sit in the library uh, looking kind of over in the corner where all these guys were around that machine that was making tape and popping out little yellow tape with dots all over the floor and kind of wondering, gosh, that, that looks interesting, but 
<clears throat> they'd laugh at me if I walked over there and, and uh, asked what was going on. And as it, ha- as it happened, one of my best friends in college, a gal that was a, she was also a, an athlete, a, a volleyball player in particular, uh, she was a, a computer science major. And I always thought, you know, wow, is she ever gutsy for getting involved in, in, in that? Uh, and t- today she's actually an environmental engineer, nothing to do with really computers. And uh, at the time I was a, an education major, and now I'm very much involved in computers. So my, my path to this career has traversed through, uh, you know, having a, a deep interest, but kind of being scared about being involved with what was going on over in the corner of the library, uh, to now being, you know, dead, dead center. Um, and I think, I think probably all of us have experienced some of the same, you know, difficulties getting to where we are. But uh, on the on the positive side, I think probably all of us have some characteristics of being fairly. Uh, you know, confident in ourselves. Uh, we haven't been um, shy about stating our position of <laughs> where other people stand. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, kind of um, some of the armor that we ha- we've had to wear over, over the years to, to get where we're at, sadly. So since we raised the issue of gray hair, you can probably guess I've been in it for a few years now and uh, when I started out, there were no women that I worked with. And as of two weeks ago, I accepted a new position working for the chief security officer of Symantec, and she is, in fact, a woman. And that represents a pretty big tectonic change for me and what I perceive in, in terms of how things are changing. Uh, it is a journey. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. We're making progress. And I think a lot of that stems from um, <clears throat> You know, I've heard that we we mistaken for secretary often these kinds of things. And but part of our role, you know, in women in these organizations is, you know, I'm leading an organization, a security organization myself, is stepping up and just not automatically assuming the role. So, I mean, I will be the first person to admit when we talk about planning a lunch meeting, I get right to it. I hop right to it. It's I have people that work for me that could absolutely do that, and I don't know why I feel compelled to step up and do that. But that is one of the hurdles that I think that we put our own selves in, or that I know that I have personally put my own self in, is, you know, it's not enough to say, yes, we've, ha- we've overcome some, some, uh, some hurdles, but we've created our own as well. So um, taking the time to step up and say, I don't need to do that kind of activity, or I don't need to... The, the printer, the, we can call somebody to take care of the, the jammed piece of paper in the printer. Um, I'm sorry that the coffee service isn't up to your standard. Why don't you call somebody? Yeah. So um, I do think that a good portion of our um, moving up in, into security roles or in technology and as a whole is letting go of that notion that you have to caretake your office. I, I don't caretake my office staff. I, in fact, um, I think in my role, my authority kind of position has helped me to shed that, let me caretake you. I think, you, this, you know, it's a really interesting point that maybe we could hear from some other folks on, too. I mean, I, I would agree with you, too, as a, as a, you know, full-time working mother and the authority figure in my publication, I am often feel compelled to organize for others and take on that role. So does anyone else feel that, to Don's point, that that can sometimes be a challenge or maybe counter to that? Um, have you spent years of your career being hell-bent on breaking that stereotype. <laughs> Nancy, I can tell you feel strong. <laughs> well, as it happens, uh, uh, my background uh, and many of my early uh, career years uh, was actually in education, and I, I was a, a, actually an athletic coach. I was a, a head coach of uh, uh, several women's athletic teams, uh, volleyball and softball in particular. And, and that th- those skills have uh, helped me a great deal over time to um, be assertive, to be organized, to delegate, to um, have assistant coaches or other people uh, do things that I needed them to do just because as a, as a, a leadership position, um, I needed to be more focused on the task at hand than worrying about, uh, you know, lunch arrangements for the team after the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so I think I've, I've uh, had those experiences early in my career, and that sort of formed my, you know, the basis for then how I've, 
been able to, to um, act in other leadership roles. Um, I, I just don't, thankfully, I, I haven't felt like I needed to make the coffee uh, or plan those arrangements. And, but I really think that came from super early on in my career where I was not, where, where I, I was not made to be in those positions. So I think it was probably really hard to shed that if that was an expectation and you somehow, you know, did those things early on. Yeah, yeah I started in IT as an yeah. admin. So yeah. I think that that's part of, like, getting rid of that was was, was a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. Carrie? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't had a problem with that. Yeah. Good. T but tell us uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm not like that. I think that's maybe personality-wise or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't plan lunches or do any of that stuff. Right, yeah. But um, uh, something I like to maybe bring up is, you know, if you uh, insert here, like, male-dominated industry, you're going to have some problems. What's different about the IT industry versus uh, some, maybe some other industries? I think that one of the uh, other worst industries to work for as a woman is, like, the financial industry. Those guys are pretty bad. Um, but in that industry, there's a lot more women than there are, but that took time. They still have to deal with, you know, being sexually harassed or, you know, looked over for promotions and stuff like that. But um, I say maybe 35 years, maybe there'll be more uh, women in our industry. It's going to take time. The girls are going to have to deal with this stuff for a while. And I think one of the contributing like factors to why it's so hard for girls in IT, um, maybe like uh, some of the guys in it are socially inept, so they don't know how to deal with women anyway. <laughs> so then when they have to work with them, you know, they're not so good at it. And maybe I think also like the certain mindset, like the sense of humor that kind of goes along with, uh, I think people in IT anyway, it, you know, it's just so cruel. Like you guys know, we're cruel. We make fun of everybody, you know, for everything. So if you're a girl, you're going to get hit with the girl jokes, you know, it's just going to happen, you know, make me a sandwich. Well, maybe I think it's more that I think IT is more casual. I think a, a better way of kind of couching it is that IT organizations tend to be more casual than, say, a finance organization. Um, but, you know, perhaps consulting is uh, an area where IT consulting is more formal because it is a, a professional services type organization. And perhaps you see a little less um, of some of the, the joking and, and what have you. But I actually don't feel like we, we have it all that bad. I, I actually find that at IT, I think given the casual nature of the environment, I think you're allowed to have more uh, better relationships with your work, with the people that you work with. And I think that as a whole, when you have relationships with people, when you're able to work with them, you don't, I think you don't encounter as much of the stereotyping because you're, an, you know, you're somebody that they work with and they know and they, I, I, ever, I actually, you know, certainly I have had my, my fair share of team outings to strip clubs. Um, that kind of thing. No, could, girl, no. That could, you know, <laughs> that could, um, could stand to. But as a whole, um, I actually just don't think that my career progression has suffered at all from, you know, I, I don't feel like I've ever been held back or ever been manipulated or, you know, in, in any kind of fashion. So what about, um, let's talk a little bit more about relationships, you know, with, with the people in, that you work with, and obviously we're, it is still a male-dominated industry. Have you had mentors over the course of your career? Have you specifically made a point to seek out female mentors, or do you think it's just as important or equally as valuable to have men as mentors in your career? Does anyone want to start with that point? Um, maybe I'll just jump in real quick with that. Um, I mean, if I could say anything, just kind of stress to other girls in the industry, never get involved with anyone you work with. I've never shat where I eat, and I suggest everybody do the same, because you'll just you lose respect if you go that route. Um, I think that girls in the industry, when they come across other girls, like sometimes they're mean, sometimes they're not nice. You know, sometimes they are nice, they're welcoming to other girls, but sometimes they're not. So you're finding a, a female mentor in it, like, well, um, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. Maybe she's going to be friendly to you. Maybe she sees you as an opponent, right. you know, so it can get very uh, competitive. Could have its challenges. Okay. Other thoughts? Um, my mentor, I, I think when it comes to seeking out a mentor, I'm not sure that um, I would seek out 
a woman mentor just because she would relate to me. I, I, my, your mentor isn't meant to be your friend. They're not. They should be somebody that can help steer your career. Um, mine was uh, the first chief of security I worked for, and you know, it, it's somebody that you can trust to have to have really candid conversations with. And um, so I, I don't necessarily think that I would seek out a, a woman, a mentor, because she's a woman. I, I need somebody that can help me um, navigate the direction of my career. Mm -hmm. Um, I, that being said, I mean, I'm open to mentoring other women in the field, but it would only have to be because there's some sort of natural connection. I feel like they have the same kind of drive and motivation that I have, because I think ultimately it's the drive and motivation that makes you go places. And I don't really think that gender will keep you or promote you any faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I concur. Uh, one of my early mentors was a, a gal, uh, Dr. Lydia Binger. And her motto was, uh, she, she was, I, I would say, maybe uh, 25 years older than I was, uh, had been in the industry a long time, and her, her motto was that uh, she was going to outlive the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she, she um, was exactly that person. She, uh, she understood the games, the politics that she needed to play to, to be in the industry as long as she was. Um, and I learned those tricks from her and learned it when I needed to keep my, my mouth shut, uh, I needed to, when I needed to play along, uh, when it was okay to say, no, I don't want to go to the shooting range um, with, with everyone. Uh, my, my current employer has a penchant for guns. And uh, uh, being about, I think there were two women, three women. One was the uh, secretary... Uh, and then myself and an, another salesperson, and uh, you know, everyone got the invite to the gun range, and <laughs> you know, it was easy to say no. I, I just didn't want to, and it, it didn't. It wasn't a problem. But yeah, as far as mentors, I, I agree. I've had both, probably um, male and female mentors. In fact, I still have one fellow that I really. Um, he's my go-to guy when I want to bounce things off him, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Binger is, is uh, retired and enjoying somewhere up in northern Minnesota. But uh, I, I still actually do contact her once in a while just to, to say, you know, what do you think about this? And she's, she's been, you know, invaluable. And honestly, uh, my husband has been another person that I've been able to bounce things off of, uh, you know, from, to get the male perspective, and that's, that's been helpful. And is Lydia still doing okay? She's doing has she outlived anybody? She, she hasn't doing? so far outlived the <laughs> I'd Sorry, add, uh, yeah, I think trust is the most important thing. You want to choose a mentor that you can be candid with and trust that your candor is held in confidence. Uh, male, female, I don't think that matters so much, although I will say having a diverse perspective that you bring in with your mentorship is really important, and your best hope of getting that is to have diverse mentors, including men and women. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't have one primary mentor. I would encourage everyone to have someone who's your go-to person, but to seek perspectives from other people that you trust as well. Great. Thank you. Susan. Yeah, I would add, also just add that I think that as a woman, particularly in any field really, um, I think women are more susceptible to how people receive them. Then I think oftentimes in mentoring conversations, men don't find that they'll enter a conversation where they're like, well you know, you're not being received well, or I think people suspect you, you know, as dingy or bad, you know, I, I, I don't think men encounter that. So part of having that, that diversity is, is getting a, a good broad sense of how are people receiving you, because that's how you ultimately can make changes to the way you move through your career, is understanding that whether or not you intend to, how you're being received is important in terms of developing your career. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to jump in on mm -hmm. that. Well, first of all, I would love to go to the shooting range, bang, bang, baby. But um, for, for me, in my experience, it's really annoying um, when I have to meet new people in the industry. I feel like I have to walk around with my resume or, like, email it to them so they can read it first so they can immediately start uh, treating me respectfully. I feel like when I meet people, it's like I'm rebooting a machine. I have to start all over again. Yes, I work in this industry. Yes, I've been in this industry a long time. Yeah, I'm bad. You know, like... I just have to go through everything again because that uh, initial expectation for people is, I don't know what it is, but it's not, uh, you know, who I actually am and 
my talent and stuff like that. So I, I think that that's really annoying. I, I constantly like just have to like start all over again every time I uh, enter a new uh, scene or group of people. So. So how, what about thoughts on taking it back even further than the career? I mean, what, what can be done, especially these days, um, you know, at an earlier level, perhaps even at the education level, uh, to foster the idea that, uh, you know, young women should be interested in these careers these days and that, you know, InfoSec and, or even just IT is something that more women should consider at the educational level. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so my, by, I guess, education or by trade, I was a linguist and not at all related to technology or security in particular. I think one of the main overlaps between languages, which I guess can be considered more female-dominated um, or proportionally has more females versus tech, the overlapping aspect is women aren't willing to jump in unless they're certain. Men are they'll just go. Like, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, they just want to talk, they just want to get out there, and as far as technology, they just want to start playing with it. Women are more cautious, like, I don't want to break it, I don't want to do something wrong in the tool. Uh, so, I think there's a, the gap of, we have to tell women, it's okay to play, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, to your point of being perceived wrong, you know, if you're making mistakes and you're learning, that's fine, you're not being perceived as, you know, less educated or less intelligent, less informed. Uh, and I think that's the gap that often keeps women back from industries like technology um, or engineering, mathematics, security, that ability to play without fear of rejection, I think. Mm -hmm. Good point. Any other thoughts on that? I don't recommend this industry for nice girls. Really? Well, could you expand on that a little bit? I mean, you, if you were going to go out and you were... I have a daughter. To to I'm going to, like, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> push her to be, like, an opera singer So or if she says, I want to be like mommy, you're like, no way. No. You're going into medical no, school. No, yeah, I'm not. No, like I, that, yeah. I just... It's been too hard for me. You remember, okay. like, the beginning of my stuff? Like, it wasn't just me that got roofied. I know, like, three other girls that got roofied. Yeah. Why does it have to be part of, like, my job thing where if I go to an event, someone's going to, like, try and flip me something? And that's common in this industry. And that's disgusting. So I, any, I'm angry. Somebody anyone else have any, you know, counter thoughts on maybe changing that culture? Or? Okay, so <laughs> the company I work for is in the education industry. Uh, we provide us software for schools to to run their business, K-12 public schools. And uh, we look at our development population. We're at about 20% of our um, our development force is is women. Um, I'm going to say the average age of our development force is 26 to 30, so a fairly young group. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very interested in looking at why, you know, why we only have 20%. We, we would like to have more. In, in particularly, you know, the education industry is predominantly women. Uh, there was a study done in 2010 by the American Association of Uni University of Women, and I, I would re really recommend anyone that's interested in growing uh, their program to attract more women. Uh, it was called uh, Why So Few, uh, the study was. Uh, and effect, uh, effectively, the communication was that, you know, the industry in general has 20% women. Um, how can we, how come we don't have so many in IT? Well, our, our farm team is still 20% women. And you really need to roll all the way back to, to middle school age, young, young, young girls and boys uh, at the middle school age and really start pushing to get them involved in uh, STEM activities, science, technology, engineering, and math. That, that curriculum alone is what is seeding all of our potential employees. If you're, if you're an employer or a, a college person looking to attract uh, undergrads, I think the answer to the low number of women in IT is really the low number of women in, in the STEM careers. And that if we want to improve that and uh, sort of get strength by numbers in IT, what we need to do is be, be doing outreach to schools at that age, uh, activities, promoting those things, providing leadership opportunities for girls and young women in, in the early years, middle school, say, on up, or perhaps even elementary school, 
um, and, and start that way. And so uh, I do agree with Carrie in that it will be a while until we get there, but it's because of this reason. We need to start way earlier than we are. If, if we have more kids that are leaving high school and going to college and involve, getting involved in, in engineering careers, then we're going to have more people to select from the, uh, the workforce, right? I agree with everything you just said, and, and I'm working in that direction myself, but I'd also add I wouldn't let that stand in our way of being proactive about recruiting in the here and now, too. There's sort of a, a habit with corporate America where we feel like we have to recruit people for skills that we need, and they have to possess those skills before they come on board. They have to be impactful the moment that they arrive. Well, and I'll say this of a former employee of my, or employer of mine because they don't exist anymore, so I can say this, Compaq. Compaq was very clear about this. We recruit for skills, but we fire people for attitude. And so how about if we change the paradigm a little bit and we recruit people for attitude and aptitude and interest and say, here's a person, a woman, a minority, some group that we already have upper, uh, underrepresented in the situation, and say, They've got the, the, the round package, the personality that we're looking for, but they don't have the exact skill set I'm looking for. Let's make an investment in them up front. Let's recruit them in, hire them, and give them education and training so that they are appropriate to the job. I agree with everything that you just said. In fact, I'm volunteering at a local magnet school to uh, lead sessions on cybersecurity and get kids engaged, and it's, uh, it's a magnet school that is particularly aimed for girls and minorities, so I've, I've, I'm making that effort to, to pull people in. But I also think there's a near-term near -term play that we need to engage as well. Well, I also think we need to talk about benefits and skills. I mean, part of, I think, our problem is that when women drop out of the workforce to have children, technology is moving so fast that we can't come back in. So, um, you know, we, we, we work in, a, in an environment where we come up with the solutions that allow people to work from home. So why are we not creating opportunities for women to maintain their careers and raise a family? I think that there's, there's definitely some room for improvement there. Like I said, you know, innovation is happening so quickly that someone's on the shelf for a year, maybe two at home raising children, and she's having a hard time getting back in. So there's a void there too. It's not enough to just get them in. We need to keep women in the field and we need to create, you know, and, and the same goes for, for, for fathers in the room. I mean, women can't, can't be, you know, manage family well if their spouses aren't. So if we start getting this culture where, where husbands are getting, fathers are getting just the same kind of benefits as women, then we can see women come up because they're getting more help at home as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had a one-year-old. <laughs> I was working as a pen tester. Um, I got pregnant. The consultancy I worked for suddenly didn't have any work for me anymore. I had to go quickly get another job. I worked all throughout my pregnancy, went right back, and I'm working uh, remotely 100%, so I get to raise my kids. So it can be done. And I mean, I also did this stuff when I was a single mom, so it can be done. Um, there's a lot of women in this room right now, and you know what? Applaud yourselves. You're here. We all know that this is hard. It's hard to be here, so. <laughs> so um, I'm mindful of our time. Before we find out that we've only got a few minutes left, I was hoping to open it up to the audience before we get into any closing thoughts. If anyone's got any questions that they'd like to throw in or comments that they would like to make right here in the front desk.
do we do differently? How do we get some of the food to come and apply for a job at our company? Uh, what, what the jobs are out there and we're trying. Did you try targeted recruiting, like um, recruiting on campus with organizations like uh, Society of Women Engineers? I find that there's a couple of groups like that's one and also the Grace Hopper Institute is a really, really great place to find qualified women for technology positions too. And so if you try a little targeted recruiting where you're trying to collect re resumes, not in the open market, but aimed in specific areas, you might be more successful or it might increase your success rate. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, we, we are pretty good about sending people to career fairs at the local U university, uh, and we try really hard to have a, a good representation of women that attend those, uh, even if they're not necessarily developers, maybe they're QA engineers or uh, re product analysts, uh, you know, but having a good representation of women at the, at the career fairs, high school career fairs, college career fairs, at uh, the state fair, they have a <laughs> career fair. So those kinds of activities are, are good. And, and have, you know, have people that are outgoing and are willing to talk to, to people, not just the uh, shrinking violet that is a good developer. I want to give everybody a chance if I can. So right here, question. So uh, Symantec has a very large population of Asian people, particularly from the Indian subcontinent, but Asian in general. That doesn't give us true diversity, I don't think. We're underrepresented in African American and, and other nationalities and cultures and races too. Uh, the problem, I think, kind of gets to the economics that higher education is expensive and minorities are economically disadvantaged. And, and so the pool that we can recruit from is much smaller. The answer is kind of what we were discussing, the long game. How can we get more kids, more minority kids, more girls engaged in STEM education and, and increase the pool by that way? Uh, yeah, Accenture ha is known for a lot of their outsourced uh, capabilities. And this I actually do see women in a lot more uh, roles and higher roles. Uh, I, in particular, manage a team in India, and the team is... Uh, we have one man and six women um, and the manager of the IDC team is a female. Um, we also have teams in Czech Republic and in South America and those teams are also predominantly, or not predominantly, but at least more equal between men and women. Um, so I guess it's a little bit split based on, you know, what role these individuals are having and um, and what capacity the company is, is growing in. Well, again, I think, um, I think about our local chapter in the Twin Cities, uh, you know, it, I'm usually one of the only women that are there. Uh, it would be really neat to think that you could have some representation even in the different chapters um, at high schools, at career fairs, at these STEM organizations. Think, I really, really feel that the, the key to getting better numbers on the, you know, on the employment end of things is to work on your numbers on the, on the growth and development end. And I don't think OWASP has done too much in the way of interacting with high school, um, summer programs, you know, science, STEM camps, robot uh, day. You know, there's just a ton of activities. And while it's not security specific, it's, uh, you know, it's heading in that direction. And so, so that would be my advice. Other questions? Yes, down here.
When I first started in security, and like I said, I was the only woman in, in IT in my first team that I was on, and um, and as the team grew, I mean, it, it grew more men and not more women into the field. Um, but I, I knew that my boss or the leadership of my organization observed that part of that problem was cultural. And just changing just a couple of the activities <coughs> It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop the party. And I think that, that women need to be mindful of that, that, um, that it's not enough to walk in and say, you're not allowed to do that anymore because I'm here. Because that's, just, that's not really the direction we want to go as women. Right? We can do things and we can be part of your team and we can be part of the fun. We just don't have to. Let's just pick better activities to do together. Let's pick different conversations to have together. Because Inevitably, we, we all get along in any other environment. I mean, men and women get along historically, you know, obviously. So why we can't figure out how to get along in the workplace, in, in, and specifically because we're in IT, it's like you don't have to choose activities that are centric to any one group. And I think women need to, to kind of, in, in some respect, suck it up a little bit and accept that it's going to take a while for the organization to recognize that this might not be an inclusive cultural norm, right? Carrie, I know as someone who's been kind of on the receiving, you've spoken very strongly about, you know, your feelings on some of those cultural challenges. Any thoughts on diffusing certain situations or, you know? Yeah, so I do, and it's, I mean, it's kind of directed not at hiring managers, I don't know what to tell you, but to the girls, to ladies. Ladies, because there's so few of us, we have to be held to a higher standard, all right? We have to be needed. You are out there and you're not representing women in this industry well, but you're just making it harder for everybody else, you know? So I think that the best way to overcome a stereotype in general is to be the exception to that and, you know, to carry yourself well enough to, um, you know, keep a high level of standard. You know, sometimes if we have some women in the industry like Marissa May or whatever, and they do stupid things and embarrass the rest of us, well, it just makes it that much harder for someone else to, you know, go be a CEO of a search engine company. So hold yourselves to a high standard, please. And I'll just say one word, respect. I, I just think that it's a, it, it's a mutual respect. You can't, you can't uh, expect to be treated fairly um, I don't think it's fair to give anyone, men or women, uh, a leg up because of their gender. Uh, and, and you have to kind of earn the respect of your peers and so behave in a way that you want to be uh, treated, treat others in that same way. So respect. Uh, I think we had a question or comment right here. Sure. So I think we're in a good, um, we're in a great place in that respect because um, our homes are filled with digital natives. My children, I have four-year-old twins, uh, can work their way around technology almost as well as I can, and I work in the field. So technology is more accessible naturally to children because it's part of pop culture. So um, Urban Outfitters, we have five brands, but you know they're they're edgy brands, and we're deliberately taking steps to put 
um, the technology, using pop culture out there, and engaging with our consumers across all platforms. So with an you know, omni-channel marketing perspective, we're grabbing those people and drawing them into the technology field through the pop culture. And I think being able to identify that and accept that this new generation of consumer or new generation of professional is already technology savvy. They already are technology professionals. We just need to adopt the way we operate or run our organizations to embrace the way that they work. And embracing the way that they work and the way they use the technology will help us bring them into our field moving forward. Finding the transition. Um, so it's like, oh, hacking's cool now? <laughs> you know, it's like all uh, in the media. I've seen it. I've seen how it's just more like widespread. People talk about it. And it's in newspapers and stuff like that all the time. So that, I think, is spurring a rise in girls coming into this industry. But I'm still saying we're 35 years out. It's going to take a it's gonna take a hot minute for the girls to catch up. And they're never going to catch up. Maybe there'll be like a, a quarter of the industry in 30 years. That's what I say. Are you a fan of the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> oh. I highly recommend it. Uh, two of the three female leads in the show are scienti scientists and uh, very strong in their own rights. Uh, and, and I've kind of seen the effect of pop culture in other fields and other genres where it's made a difference in how society accepts or expects uh, behavior to occur. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the Big Bang Theory, both for the humor side of it. I think I've worked with all of those people before. But also for the social change that it's engendering. And so, yeah, I am seeing that. There's also a negative side to it, too, and I'll acknowledge Kelly here. Kelly got me to watch this uh, documentary film called Misrepresentation, and it's about how women are intentionally objectified in mass media. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to watch it. It was kind of fascinating and informing. It, not everything in it is a surprise, but there's some things in there that really make you think. So uh, pop culture can be both a positive and a negative influence, and so the chore for all of us is to absorb the positive side and reject the negative side. Mm -hmm. uh, to jump in, I, I almost take the exact opposite approach. Um, it's not that women don't see, you know, hacking is cool, like as Big Bang, there are two great females. But there's still office space, the movie, where tech is seen as a geeky guy industry that sexy girls don't want to be a part of. Like, you know, I'm too cool to be in technology um, because even though there are cool women there, there aren't cool men there. Um, so I think it has to morph the whole industry of, you know, tech isn't seen as a back office. Um, I sit alone in a cubicle down in the basement. It needs to morph as an industry to this is something that's cool and accessible and, you know, everyone should want to aspire to it, not female male, I think. <laughs> it's still quoted daily in my yeah. office. It's, it's iconic, but yeah. at the same time, you know, we're, we're seeing the revolution of things. Well, and even in the cultural change also um, that you mentioned is, you know, part of that is, is this women in leadership. And we have five people on the panel, and at least two organizations have CISOs that are women. So, you know, you, it's not even just about bringing us up in numbers, but bringing us up in leadership. And you're seeing that leadership, when I'm seeing heads nodding. It's, it's not just about getting women into the field. I mean, it, you get into that leadership space and you just create that different culture that's more accepting across both genders. I think, um, I do think, from my perspective, we've made great strides from the Jimmy Fallon, Nick Burns, your company's computer guy days about 15 years ago, the guy who you know, with the, the geek that could, you know, make every, shame everybody. Move. Really. Yeah, move. Okay. Um, we are running out of time, so I have some closing thoughts. Um, one of the goals of this panel that we had talked about before we all came out here was to talk about some action points. How can we keep this conversation going beyond just events like this? I mean, what, you know, does anybody have, anybody have any thoughts about how you might take this back to your workplace, in your career, how we might continue these efforts and some action items we could you know, perhaps dedicate ourselves to going forward in the next few years. So we'll start with Don. Uh, so I participate in a couple different women's groups um, in technology. There's Women in Information Technology, and there's the Women's 
Technology Leadership Forum. Um, and then, you know, also in our alumni group. I mean, everybody here went somewhere. So I just recently graduated from St. Joseph's and University in Philadelphia, and they have She United. And, um, and just being a part of that organization and bringing the topic up for discussion, um, is, I think, is the best way to move it forward. The other things is to talk about, for women, you know, since we largely fill the room, um, <clears throat> is to talk about that benefits component. Like, how can you make sure that you don't have to put your career on ice when you leave the technology workforce? Because I do think it's more challenging for a woman in technology to drop from the workforce for a period of greater than six or nine months than it is for a man. So how do we go back to our organizations and, and draw upon building better benefit packages for both fathers and mothers when their you know, children come in? Great thoughts. Any other thoughts going forward, action items? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, hey, uh, Katie, what, what was that website for the girls, the black girl coders or something? What was that? What? What? Girls can code. So there, there are a couple like organizations where it reaches out to minor, minority girls who are in, in black girl code, right? Black girl code. So I mean, there are some sites and stuff like that where girls can uh, get get resources. There are women's groups. There's girls in technology meetups and stuff like that. But, you know, so there's there's some vectors where girls can kind of unite. In my professional experience, I did four years at a company that was. <laughs> All, like 99% all women. Mm -hmm. So if anyone ever gets really frustrated, just go work at an all-girl company and be the IT. <laughs> you can do that. They have that. So you know, <laughs> there, there's hope. I think. Just keep trying. Last thoughts, Nancy. I, and I, I think we can also think about leveraging social media, leveraging um, technology uh, to, you know, make it a point to. Uh, point out other women in the career. So, you know, publicly calling out people that are doing a good job, uh, tweeting about this panel and uh, uh, naming the, the women involved. So, you know, uh, search engines uh, look at volume as well as other components, but just the sheer volume. So if you're, uh, if, if you want to raise this uh, in the public awareness, do it through social media. That's another outlet for us to call out each other as, as being good role models or interesting people or, you know, whatever. I got involved in advocacy because Semantic has a diversity and inclusion program and I was asked to be one of their leaders. My advice to all of you is get involved in your DNI programs and if you don't have one, start one. Yeah, and I, said, and I think the other thing that we have talked about greatly is the, that those cultural nuances. It's like it, if we can do anything, it's walk out of here and go, you know what, maybe we're not creating an environment that's awesome. You know, how do we, how do we be an awesome team together, working together without doing, without going to strip club, that's all I'm saying. Right. Absolutely. All right, great. Well, I want to thank our panelists again very much for your thoughts and insight onto this issue. And thank you all for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the event. <laughs>